thank you uh, for either being back or for actually making it now with your flights. I know some of you were traveling last night. It's great to see you. It was great last night to see uh, so many friends and uh, alumni reconnect. Uh, it's been actually far too long, so it's just really wonderful. Um, I wanted to extend the welcome also on behalf of the Dean Mosen Mostafavi, who can't be here today. He had a long-standing commitment in Japan, but he wanted me to convey that TA is very sorry to miss the event, but uh, to stress how important the DDES and the entire Advanced Studies program is for the school. And it's true, over the last 10 years, we have certainly focused a lot on ASP, expanded the MDES, which always had a special relationship to the DDES. Um, he's mentioning he's happy and confident that this will be a great success. And uh, we're all very proud to have such amazing ambassadors in you, uh, out there in the academy, in practice, and in the public sector. Uh, so today, uh, we sort of turn this basically over to you. This is about so your stories, pathways, uh, which will frame in the context of three sessions that look at uh, the DDoS in the private sector and the public sector, and ultimately in the academy. Um, before we turn this over to you, I wanted to start to frame things a little bit in a historical way. Of course, I have the disclaimer that I'm probably the least qualified person to do so because I'm the youngest program director. Uh, but to the historians in the room, I want to assure you that I did check with my primary sources, so I hope this will be more or less accurate. If not, uh, those of you who've been around longer, feel free to correct me. It's going to be pretty relaxed. So, as you see on the representation of the mapping of the alumni globally, it really is a global community, and I'd like to thank Lara Tomholt and Guy Transos for producing the map uh, for us today. Uh, let me start with uh, just a few numbers. We have 180 graduates, as far as um, I can tell, and of those, uh, we also have 47 who will at some point uh, show up here today, which is a great turnout. And we're very happy to, to make that happen. So um, we saw the sort of geographical distribution of the DDS before on the, on the world map. And I thought what we could do today in my historical sketch to kind of uh, look at the landscape of the DDS in a slightly more thematic way, which in the end will give us a kind of uh, view of, uh, of sort of continents and islands that are somewhat fragmented uh, of this sort, you know, I'll, I'll have this uh, evolve a little bit. But uh, we should start the story probably at the beginning, and that takes us back to about 1985, and uh, Peter alluded to that yesterday, um, and look at the sort of founding fathers of the program. Certainly there's uh, Dean Gerald McHugh, who might be actually coming by today, uh, Dean from 1980 to 92. Uh, then there's a kind of founding committee that was called Steinitz, William Doble and Peter Rowe, who had just joined the school in 85. And this is a situation where uh, in 1980, the planning program had been transferred to the Kennedy School. And what that meant for the school that we had actually lost a lot of students. Um, and we essentially had uh, faculty a lot of faculty here, but not necessarily enough students. So there was that situation. And frankly, the GC had been in financial trouble for quite a while. Um, we had been running a deficit. Uh, so we had that situation. At the, and at the same time, we had had the, the PhD program, which of course is administered by the FAS. So there was A, the kind of situation of having faculty here, but B, the also desire to have a doctor program that was really owned and run by the GST. So discussions on this started probably in the 80, in 84, and under McHugh's leadership, there was uh, the faculty recognized that the GST needed to broaden its educational approach, and we then ultimately started the DDES and the MDES at the same time in 1985. So going through the course bulletins, the 85 bulletin first lists the DDES and the MDES, and they were positioned as closely related programs, actually run almost under the same umbrella. Of course, things were hotly debated. We have some wonderful quotes here. Uh, yes, we're doing that, well, we do very well, but we're losing money. <laughs> well, that's not so good. Okay, some things just don't change. Um, and then sort of some critical voices. So the, I think the culture of the school wasn't all that different then. 
Um, but uh, so we did kick off the program. This, this is now our first uh, course bulletin uh, with uh, listing Karl Steinitz as the program director. We had a two-year program at the time, and this was frankly very ambitious, maybe too ambitious. Um, it was just honestly difficult for anybody to do a year of coursework and then a year of thesis writing and finish it all in two years. Um, but uh, that's how we started. Um, and this was always positioned as a post-professional degree. Uh, and the hope had been that having applicants come uh, with that sort of credential and possibly even with professional experience would allow them to kind of fast track uh, doctoral studies. And that didn't always turn out to be true. But we ended up in the, in the first year, certainly a lot of graduates finished in about two and a half years. We were just actually chatting with Alvin Lam, who you see later, the very first graduate who finished in two and a half years. And that continued for a while. Um, the sort of uh, delicate task at that point was uh, to differentiate the DDS from the PhD. And um, so clearly the DDS was positioned as a more professional degree. This is a quote from the, the catalog that you see there, solving applied problems um, rather than kind of more theoretical problems. In, in my Skype conversation with Carl Steinitz, who is in London, he sort of positioned in, in sort of more practical terms. He did the the PhDs were mostly talkers. The DDs were talkers and doers. So I think that's another way of putting it, right? Um, <laughs> and just uh, interesting from a historical standpoint, the tuition was full ride was nine thousand five hundred dollars. Then um, this is about just over twenty one thousand dollars in current dollars. If you look at inflation, it's kind of interesting. If you think of the price tag today. And certainly, there's been a lot of press coverage on the sort of financial crisis of higher education. And we can sort of see why that is the case. Um, all right, so just keeping, keeping this moving, uh, this is a range of program directors. I left myself out because I'm up here, so we don't need to have any images there. So Carl, uh, Tony uh, gomez Libanes, who's actually in the audience. Um, so over the next 10 years after its founding, the program D developed actually nicely, initially mostly recruiting internally, uh, but then certainly reaching out and taking in about four, sometimes five or six students uh, every year. Uh, these numbers are really based on finance, uh, on what we were able to uh, provide as support for students. It wasn't as much based on capacity for advising. Um, uh, so after Tony Gomez's uh, term, we had uh, Spiro Polalis as program director. And he introduced uh, several changes. Um, one was that the sort of duration expanded to, to three years, which was simply more realistic. Um, the research areas of the DDS, which had been previously much aligned with the MDES, became more defined as now management, technology, real estate, and urban planning. He also introduced a distance learning option. We have Janine Clifford here who may have been one of the few, or maybe the only one, who somehow took advantage of that. We might be hearing from her later. Um, there's a few other things happened. We introduced the public defense. Uh, we introduced the hooding ceremony at commencement. Uh, and the Spiro mentioned specifically that any kind of decision he made, he would be initially discussing it with Dan Shodek, who in, in a way was, was very much involved in running the program and kind of uh, mentoring it uh, at that time. Hashim Sarkis then followed the Spiro as program director, which leads us almost to the present day with Antoine Picon, uh, who you're going to see up here in a moment. Um, and on Antoine, uh, the sort of financial structure became a kind of very, very even distribution of support to all students. Um, Antoine actually chaired both the PhD and the DDS program uh, with the goal of really producing a kind of perception of the program where both uh, doctoral pathways are recognized as equal in value but different in, in, kind, of, in kind of emphasis. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's been a very important uh, contribution to the program. We should also mention the staff program administrators that were obviously very important in making things happen. Mimi Truslow, uh, initially when I came here, uh, Barbara Alpha, Maria Moran, Jen Swarthout, right now we have Margaret Moore and Liz Thorsonson who are running everything behind the scenes and it really couldn't happen without them. But let's go back now briefly to this landscape of the DDS now showing also 
the relation to the sort of thematic uh, topical areas and the different program directors, as well as the deans. And the color coding here, as you recognize, is the sort of mustard color, is architecture, green landscape appropriately, and then green urban planning and design. Uh, and so these are sort of representing now the graduates that we have, I had in my database, which may or may not be complete, uh, relating to different advisors. Um, and uh, so that the, the shades of uh, colors in the squares represent the number of graduates those years. So you can see definitely there's an expansion happening in the 2000s, which of course, because there's a kind of lead time of two to three years, but was started by admitting more students earlier on under uh, when uh, Spiro and, and Tashim were running the program. Uh, and so certainly if you look at the sort of fever curve of graduations, uh, it does fluctuate quite a bit between 1 and 10 every year, and that sort of continues to be true today. So I wanted to wrap up uh, with a quick historic sketch on the technology components of the DDIS program. I think the DDIS and MDIS, to be sure, uh, were quite uh, important in sort of uh, fermenting and solidifying efforts in the technology area of the school. Uh, on the one hand, certainly, uh, this relates to the presence and work of Dan Shodek, uh, uh, Kumagai Professor of Architectural Technology at the time. So the, the sort of starting launching of uh, introducing computer-aided manufacturing as a topic in education, in teaching. Uh, there's actually a number of us uh, former students of his here who worked on CAD CAM in different ways that produced uh, sort of smaller artifacts products, but also you know, bigger things. And I remember working on this uh, with a number of students and having conversations with Dan. And uh, he actually suggested, oh, maybe we should put this thing on a trailer and, and, and run around Cambridge. And so he had these wonderful wild ideas. Um, a lot of the DDIS went through the sort of GSD 6317 CAT CAM. We still have that course. It has a different number now. So really introducing uh, the sort of architectural education community to uh, what we call CAT CAM then. It would be now called uh, digital fabrication. Uh, a series of books and publications, both in-house and externally published, uh, became the output of that time often co-authored with current DDIS or former DDIS. And certainly, there's a lot of interesting work also happening in the smart materials area. We had Michelle Addington here last night, she'll be back. She might be in the audience now, I can't see. Um, certainly, she and uh, Dan Shodek sort of took that topic and introduced it really as the very first uh, uh, time uh, to an architectural audience, and then ultimately producing also books on that topic. Reviews were always sort of inspiring. We eventually invested in robotics. Um, so here's some reviews uh, with Kimo Griggs, Costas, Dan Shodek, and others. Um, these were sort of interactive sessions where we casually mixed the digital and the analog. Uh, they were hands-on. We had uh, it was engaging, it was fun, uh, and uh, we never sort of lost track that the need was always in the technology area to connect to a physical reality of things. Um, so I'd like to mention at this point that. Uh, in recognizing Dan's uh, legacy, uh, there has been a very generous um, endowment established to, to have the only fellowship actually for a DDA student that works in the technology or environmental area. We actually have Kay Shodek and Ben Shodek in the audience who established this fellowship that supports uh, a student every year. And that one, I just wanted to recognize that uh, as, uh, as being very, very important to uh, help also the program flourish. So let me uh, return briefly to the numbers before turning over the podium to Antoine Picon. So I mentioned we have 180 graduates. And uh, so doing the numbers, uh, about 102 of them are in the academy, some of them part-time, which means they might also be in private practice. Uh, so it depends a bit how you count. 11, I would say, are in the public sector, government. Uh, 41 in the private sector. A lot of entrepreneurship, starting companies, actually very impressive to see. And the remaining blue dots, we're just not so sure. So uh, just uh, my data set is not, is not perfect. I, and there's actually three, in, and two, three who started NGOs. That one I do know. So uh, I think I'll wrap up here. And uh, I'd like to introduce now the next two speakers. Uh, I'll, I'll do a kind of bulk introduction. Uh, we have Antoine Picon and Charles Waltheim uh, coming up next. Uh, 
Antoine Pécan is the G. Ware Chabotstead Professor of the History of Architecture and Technology, teaching courses in history and theory of architecture and technology. He's actually a true Renaissance man, I would say, trained as engineer, architect, and historian, now mostly wearing the historian's hat, uh, but the other hats still fit perfectly well. Uh, he works on the history of architectural and urban technology from the 18th century to the present. Uh, currently serves as the research director at the GC, and as I mentioned before, he was also director of the Doctor of Design program for about eight years. He'll be followed in his comments by Charles Waltheim, who is the former chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture and the current John Irving Professor in that department. He is a Canadian-American architect and urbanist directing right now the school's Office for Urbanization. He works on topics that examine the relation between landscape, ecology, and contemporary urbanism. And among many other awards was the recent recipient of the Rome Prize Fellowship from the American Academy in Rome. So uh, we'll ask Antoine Picon to come up first, and then followed by Charles Waltheim. So please welcome Antoine Picon. Thank you, Martin. Um, first of all, I'm very happy to be here. The, I've chaired, as Martin uh, said, the DDES program for a while, something like nine years chair and co-chair. So I was tempted to indulge in the evocation of some of the great souvenirs I have of the program and its students. But since I'm a very optimistic person, I, I've decided to leave this for the 40th anniversary of the program. So what I would like to do instead is to devote a few thoughts on what kind of program is the DDES. Some of you may have had, especially the youngest, in a more or less recent past to answer this question while you're applying for your first or second job. Uh, basically, what is exactly the DDES? Is the DDES a kind of PhD? Is it something of a different nature? Uh, this is a question that I was all the more confronted to that during the years of my tenure as chair of the DDES, I was also chair of the PhD program. So what I tried is actually to understand what are respectively these two programs. There is, of course, the usual institutional answer about the Harvard Graduate School of Arts and Science being not that smart and exerting a quasi-monopoly on the PhD domination, denomination, so we had to do the thing of our own, and you remind us of that story, of course. But then the question becomes, why does the DDS not fall into the established academic frame of the Graduate School of Arts and Science? I think what makes the DDES unique is certainly not a matter of domains of interest. Contrary, by the way, to the official explanation of an invoked, even if some of these domains are indeed underrepresented at Harvard outside the GSD. I would say that most DDES students work in relatively well-defined and almost standard fields, such as digital technologies, fabrication, urban development, landscape, to name only a few domains. The method or the types of deliverables are not the question either. At the end of the day, TDES dissertation turned to be pretty classically written. I'm mentioning that because I receive very often a lot of questions from Europeans, you know, asking you what do you produce exactly in the DDES, do you do design, etc. Actually, I have to tell them, you know, they write. So, <laughs> so, um, so the. I think the answer might lie actually in the overall spirit that permeates the program. So although it would be tempting to characterize as it was at the beginning the DDES as a professional PhD, this was again probably the case at the beginning, as Martin suggested, I don't think it's uh, the case no longer today. Indeed, Theoretical inquiry appears as a significant dimension of many DDES dissertation, and yesterday Peter Rowe gave us a brilliant demonstration that theory is certainly not foreign to DDES students. I was thinking, my God, there is only a DDES audience who can have such a dense lecture past six o'clock. Uh, <laughs> thank you again, Peter. Uh, Equally misleading from the same perspective would be the term applied, at least if it leads to believe that there is something called theory that hovers about, above the practical character of so-called applied research. So I thought a lot about how would I call the DDS, and I would prefer by the end to call it experimental. 
the DDAS is a profoundly experimental PhD. So let me try to precise what I mean by that. Of course, most PhD in science and technology are experimental. They deal with experiments, etc. But most of their experiments follow what philosopher of science Thomas Kuhn once called paradigm. Their experiments are usually based on well-grounded scientific theories and facts, and they refine these theories and facts. And Kuhn gave the classical example of physicists working on a subject like refining the definition of the fundamental constant appearing in physical laws. The DDAS actually operates in a more uncertain field where the rules are far less evident than in other domains. This account for both it's stressful, because let's be clear, there is usually a stress in the first year. What am I going to do? Uh, how can I define exactly what I'm going to do? So stressful and exciting character. I've been always excited to follow DDES students because they have in many ways to invent their field instead of being assigned a predetermined position somewhere. This is all the more paradoxical, by the way, that DDES student, given the short span of the program, although most of the DDES actually do, are, stay a bit longer than four years, but they are, are supposed to arrive with a well-defined research topic. In practice, they have to invent this topic and above all define the fields with, where it fits while in their first years in the program. This is where design, in an extended sense of course, what we saw yesterday with Peter, comes into play. This program is about what design can achieve. It is about decision making, let it be about construction or city planning. And this orientation accounts for the present day vogue of topics like digital fabrication. It explains also something a bit special for me, which is the number of artists who found uh, a welcoming place in the DDES program. I've had actually to, uh, to follow a few of these artists and supervised uh, their dissertation, and they have actually helped me understand better what the program is about. Of course, this has not always been an easy itinerary to follow. An artist trying to contribute to academia can be exhausting at times. More generally, I've always been struck by the fact that the students that have uh, had the pleasure to deal with, to advise, or uh, to discuss with in the program have always have been strong personalities, relatively difficult to frame, to put into uh, a box. They have worked on relatively unconventional subjects, or rather, on important subjects often envisaged in an unconventional way. From the relation between design and a certain contemporary nomadic condition, that was my first DDES student, uh, to the possibility to democratize digital fabrication. And from the role, I even had somebody on the role of science fiction in urban imagination to the interaction between social networks and contemporary social movement. But I'd like to return to the small cohort of artists proper because they might be perhaps emblematic of a larger DDES condition. The major challenge for artists all over the world who choose to pursue a doctoral degree is to make it the distinction between their work as artists and what a dissertation entails. As artists, you produce pieces. As a, a doctoral uh, student, you refine an argument and back it up by research. Contrary to traditional PhD students, many DDES students are heavily interested in production, lest this production be pieces of software, constructive components, or city plans. But the DDES is ultimately not about this. It's about harnessing this interest for the practical outcome of design to raise general questions pertaining to its practice and agency. So when I say that the DDES was not a professional PhD in that narrow sense, uh, one could say that the DDES contributes in a major way to professional cultures than to the profession directly. It contributes to replace action within a broader frame where knowledge, but also ethical values, play a role. One of the reasons it moves in a less certain realm than other programs is that it relates to a world that is partly already there partly awaiting design to take shape. Peter Rowe mentioned Herbert Simon yesterday. Simon would definitely be a good godfather if we needed you know, some kind of godfather to, for the program. Would be a good godfather to the DDES with his notion of sciences of the artificial. 
Even if many of our DDES students are interested in the management of natural resources, they all deal with a hybrid composition of natural and artificial dimension. This is a position that is more and more recognized as a uh, more, more interesting than a classic one when dealing with our planets and its challenges. It's more interesting certainly than to consider that science and technology are looking at the world from a peaceful distance. One of the reasons that make the DDES program a bit stressful also is that it's an engaged program. It does not have the disinterestedness that Kant assimilated with aesthetic judgment. In the DDES, aesthetic is not disinterested but invested with all sorts of concerns. I mentioned artists as emblematic of a certain DDES condition. Let me reassure you, there have always been a small stream of artists. Let's not exaggerate. But it's, for me, quite emblematic of the spirit of the program. It's, by the way, interesting that the, the place of the arts in doctoral studies is now a widely discussed thing all over the world. And you know, I very often boast that in the DDES, we've had quite a number of these people contributing in a highly significant way. It's uh, a question of articulation between the humanities, the social science, science and technology with the arts. Again, it's linked to the question that we have probably to design the world while we explore it. The DDES program has been a pioneer on this path and is still very much ahead of its competitor. It is perhaps the most emblematic program of what the GSD is ultimately about, which is really to explore and invent the world simultaneously. This is, for me, what an experimental PhD is about. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Antoine. Thanks, Martin, and to all of you. Um, I've been asked to um, extend uh, those remarks and say a little bit more specifically about the urban arts and about landscape. Um, and I want to um, begin by admitting, um, given that I've been here only for eight years and have been advising the DDES for the past 10, um, that I have maybe less knowledge on this topic or these topics than many of you. Um, but I thought what I could contribute is really to pick up where Antoine left off and to talk about the ways in which the DDES is, um, among other things, a distinguishing characteristic of the school. Um, and I think it's been brought out both last night and today that it's often described in terms of it being applied, its proximity to professional or design activities. And I think that's fair. But I think a part of that um, description comes out of an oral tradition and oral history in which the origins of the, of the Doctor of Design itself were meant to explain themselves vis-a-vis -vis the PhD, as Antoine was mentioning. I do believe there's something much more audacious, much more profound in terms of identity, um, if, if even epistemology at work there. And so in that regard, I would look back not even 30 years ago to the founding of the DDES, but equally to 80 years ago to the founding of the school. Of course, the first coursework uh, in architecture on the East Coast you know, emerged here in the second half of the 19th century. And by the turn of the 19th century, we saw here on this campus uh, coursework in architecture, programs in landscape architecture, and the nascent beginnings of what would become ultimately uh, planning. And as American universities consolidated and in some ways professionalized uh, those uh, activities, most schools used rubrics of schools of architecture, uh, schools of applied arts, or schools of fine arts. Now, many of those uh, nomenclatures are still with us to good effect, um, but I think it's significant here that by the middle of the 1930s, another alternative emerged here uh, in Cambridge for the idea of um, the school of design. And in this regard, it was not simply an administrative issue. It was not simply that bringing together architecture and landscape architecture and, and planning uh, in, was invoked as a reason to reformulate design. It was, in fact, true that architecture landscape architecture and urban planning had been historically taught together in the scientific school here for many years, at least since 1914, adjacent as they should have been pro pro professionally. But it was in fact a response to the social and economic and political crises of the depression of the 19, uh, late 1920s and 1930s that um, an ambitious president, Conant, uh, and an ambitious young dean, Hudnut, decided to invoke design as a framework to address the more uh, socially, politically, and I could also say from our perspective today, environmentally engaged questions. 
It's maybe fair to admit here that this was not something that really came from the faculty. This was not really a bottom-up, grassroots. The Beaux-Arts faculty, quite good as they were, didn't seem to have much of an interest in this. It was very much a top-down, uh, by executive fiat, uh, reorganization with a very clear intellectual project, one looking to Europe and looking to a broader social uh, tradition of design, in which design could be seen as a rubric through which we might have access to a range of social and political issues. Uh, in his uh, January 1936 memo to President Connaught, uh, Joseph Hudnut wrote that the word design, quote, is to be understood as including all of those processes by which the visual arts are created, the processes by which materials are assembled and shaped in such a way as to afford aesthetic satisfaction. Design, therefore, includes architecture, landscape architecture, and regional planning. And you can see that Hudnut already has a much more ambitious claim that I think Antoine's comments spoke to directly, which is design is a much broader uh, framework for doing work in the academy. It's in that context that many of us these days are engaged in and working around concepts of design research, as of course uh, Peter Rowe uh, spoke to last night and has over the course of his career and his leadership in the school. In this regard, we've been, many of us, rereading Herbert Simon these days. And of course, in Simon's uh, seminal 1969, The Sciences of the Artificial, argued um, that the natural sciences are primarily concerned with how things are, whereas design is primarily concerned with how things ought to be. And I, I want to signal two things there that I think are embedded in the agenda of the Doctor of Design that are notable there. On the one hand, note that Simon is, of course, the Nobel win, Prize winning uh, economist and political theorist, right? So he's somebody who's playing offense across campus, across other disciplines. And he found in design a mode of engagement in the world that had its own intellectual and epistemological histories that was quite significant. Another important note here is that he's signaling, Simon, the condition of the status of our work in design research, that our products of labor here in this building are most often exhibited in a dual valence, that on the one hand, they most often stand for uh, interventions in the world that are conceivable, things we might be able to do in the world, but they also stand as bodies of knowledge in our fields. And it's that confusion, I think, most often that positions design in a slightly opaque uh, valence relative to our colleagues across campus, because most often our colleagues across campus, certainly the natural sciences, the social sciences, and across the humanities, the norm normative modes of production are producing knowledge in their field about the world, but don't nearly go so far as to propose intervention in that world. And in this regard, Simon is instructive in situating design as a framework, an epistemological framework in which we have a lot in common with engineering, business, medicine, law, and, and, and the like. And so in my brief remarks uh, this morning, what I do want to suggest is that among the motivations that I had um, to join the faculty here eight years ago was the presence and robust history of the Doctor of Design and the idea that I might, in fact, have access to doctoral candidates and to benefit from their work and that tradition. And while I've only been advising candidates for the past 10 years out of its 30-year history, I have uh, benefited from that experience enormously. And so I can say a little bit about our urban commitments uh, and our commitments to landscape uh, these days. Of course, um, we might say that over the past decade, there has been a return to interest in landscape and urbanism from a very particular intellectual point of view. I think that's uh, consistent with the intellectual formations of the school, faculty appointments, and the like. But of course, in its very inception, the DDES from, from its very uh, conception was deeply concerned with questions of urbanism uh, and landscape. Of course, as has already been mentioned, uh, in its very formation, both Dean McHugh, but also Peter Rowe and Carl Steinitz, were committed to uh, working on applied research on urban and landscape subjects. And of course, uh, among those early examples that would be, would be notable, at least in, in, my, in, my, in my line of work, would be the work of Dr. Kang Jun Yu, right, who comes here from the Beijing Forestry School. He happens to be working in Beijing Forestry at a point in time when Carl Steinitz is on one of his world tours. Uh, and he, in fact, invites um, Kang Jun Yu to translate his lectures. There, Carl encourages him to apply to this new nascent program and in fact, Kang Jun-Yu does matriculate here and complete his graduate work in the early 90s. And in that work, he brings together both work coming out of the Laboratory for Computer Graphics that Carl and others had been engaged in, but equally the work of Richard Foreman, Landscape Ecology, and a range of faculty on a range of subjects, including game theory. Uh, both that uh, dissertation, but equally the impact of Turinscape and its development of uh, the graduate program at Peking U at Beida are significant here, as is the idea that out of the dissertation work, um, Kang 
Zhang Zhenyu begins the work on what will ultimately become the National Ecological Security Plan for China. So that's the kind of intellectual trajectory in which, of course, urbanism and landscape has been embedded in the program since its inception. More recently, and over the 10 years that I've been engaged with the program, I think of both Antoine Picon and Hashim Sarkis, among many others, as advising urbanists and urban and landscape topics on a range of sites uh, and subjects. My own engagement with Adidas began uh, more, um, uh, more uh, coincidentally when I was at the University of Toronto. About a dozen years ago, um, I got a phone call uh, from my friend Ken Frampton at Columbia. And he said he had just met uh, an Irish landscape architect, a person that had done his uh, graduate work in landscape architecture at the University of Pennsylvania, and that this person was interested to do a doctoral degree around landscape urbanism, around my work. And I thought, well, that's flattering and nice, but we're not really set up at the University of Toronto to do doctoral work in this way. You might encourage this fellow to go talk to our friends in Cambridge and look into the Doctor of Design program. Uh, I was very pleased that, in fact, he did apply and matriculated and began a course of work on his dissertation, beginning with landscape urbanism, but then with Hashim's guidance, working very closely with Hashim Sarkis and with Neil Kirkwood, this work developed into an interest in the status of landscape in different parts of the Gulf, and then that was followed by a series of um, engagements through field work. Uh, this fellow then, within doctoral work, began to study ethnography, anthropology, and ultimately learned Arabic sufficiently to spend a year in the Gulf. Um, uh, that fellow, Gareth Doherty, is with us today as an assistant professor of landscape architecture here, but he also has now recently turned his dissertation on the meaning of landscape in Bahrain into a new book with the University of California Press, uh, which has to do with paradoxes of green. He was also one of the uh, ringleaders uh, with Hashem and others founding the New Geographies Journal, which is a, a central intellectual instrument now for the doctoral uh, program. Uh, but at the same moment, uh, Gareth Doherty's uh, issue in the New Geographies Journal around color and urbanism was really groundbreaking. I think it's really quite significant. So that those are two brief examples, but what I want to suggest to you is that we now have uh, at least uh, half a dozen DDAs that I'm aware of that I'm advising that are working on a range of sites and subjects, and they're accompanied by a range of other uh, colleagues working on urban and landscape subjects. Among the topics uh, that I'm most often engaging with with our doctoral cohort, they're really fleshing out the intellectual and pr practical ambitions around landscape urbanism or ecological urbanism topics, and in that regard, Regard. Uh, I've recently had doctoral candidates working on concepts of weak urbanism, uh, questions of political economy in the history of ecological thinking, questions of urban thermodynamics as they're applied to ecology, questions of autonomy, cultural autonomy and urban form, and verticalism and advanced capital. And th that work has been advised by a range of faculty, but most notably my engagements have been with some of the recent additions to the faculty around landscape and urbanism, Anita Beres-Bieta, Pierre Bellanger, Neil Brenner, Mosin, Mustafavi, among others. Uh, and I don't mean in any way to suggest that's the breadth of those ambitions, but we have many, many faculty working on, as we do doctoral candidates on a, rain, a range of sites and subjects around the urban arts. Um, be, be, beyond that, what I would just close with are some observations that I think I can draw from my uh, past decade of experience and what I see as the DDES uh, going forward. Uh, first of all, I would say that the state of the Doctor of Design commitments to the urban arts and to landscape is quite strong. Uh, uh, we've enjoyed and benefited from great leadership over the course of this program's history, as was noted by Martin, but in fact, Martin's own leadership, Antoine's and Mosin's, has been vigorous, robust, and we are closing the gap on our funding differential between the PhD and the DDES, which had historically been one of those anomalies. Um, we continue to generate enormously talented applicants. We have great yield rates for our offers, and we have very good outcomes. Uh, the doctoral cohort that I've worked with have produced assistant and associate professors, program directors in notable programs on the East and the West Coast. And in addition to the other outcomes that we see on Martin's charts, most of these graduates are going to consequential careers in the production of knowledge in our fields. Most importantly, what I would leave you with is that that original uh, question, that question of original sin, the complementarity or the differentiation between the DDAs and the PhD, I think from my perspective today is a non-issue. When I look at outcomes, what I see is that when the PhD graduates and the DDES graduates go out on the market, they are different. They're different in habit of mind, different in subject matter and sites of work. But most notably, while we continue to have you know, the finest PhD program producing a very small number directly admitted to the priesthood of history, the complementarity with uh, the applied work of the DDES is now quite clear. And at the same moment, the range of sites and subjects continues to be quite fecund, as my colleagues have suggested. In this context, I would suggest that the um, 
doctorate design program will continue to follow the intellectual commitments of the school, both in its breadth and its depth, and in this sense, I think, is among the most significant indicators of the intellectual commitments of the school going forward. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Charles and Antoine. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we're going to more or less keep um, this moving now. Uh, maybe we can sort of uh, connect to this in the discussion of the, of the first panel. So I will now actually introduce uh, the faculty host of the following sessions. Our first uh, session will be focusing on the DDIS in, in practice. Uh, actually, before I do this, I just I need to mention one thing. Um, which is to say that the DDIS have certainly also strengthened uh, very robustly so the connection of the GSD across the campus. Um, they work with faculty not just at the GSD, uh, but also at the business school, at the Kennedy School, at the engineering school. So the kind of vision of one Harvard in a way comes to life also through the increasingly complex topics of the DDIS. So with that now, I will introduce um, Bing Wang, who's going to host uh, the next session. Uh, Bing is Associate Professor in Practice of Real Estate and the Built Environment at the GSD. She graduated from the DDIS in 2004, teaches design and real estate courses. She's also the area coordinator of the Master of the MDS Studies Program in Real Estate and Built Environment, co-chairs the Real Estate Management, Design, Finance and Leadership Program, uh, jointly run between the GC and the Harvard Business School, and also co-chairs the Advanced Real Estate Development Program at the GSD. She's on the board of numerous journals in her field, lectures internationally, and also principal of uh, her own firm, Hyperbina Design Group, that uh, does both work on the architectural as well as on the urban level. So please welcome Bing Wang. Thank you, Martin. Um, good morning. Welcome to the first panel discussion of the day, titled Into Practice, Innovation, Creativity, and Design Entrepreneurship. This panel will focus on the interplay between design and entrepreneurship, as well as the various possibilities in which design can act as research and vice versa in the practice of proposing creative solutions to address the real world needs. We have four panelists. All of them were trained as designers and received DDES education at the GSD. Today, they are either co-founding partners of their own business or they're leading their own teams within a larger organization. I have asked them to share their unique perspectives and experiences with regard to how research, including theoretical, empirical, and technological research intertwine with design, and to what extent their design education has facilitated the formation of the entrepreneurship that they need in everyday practice. So um, I will ask uh, each speaker to give a 15 minutes presentation. And after their presentations, I will ask uh, Professor Ali Makawi to comment and reflect on the discussion. And then we'll open to the floor for questions. So if you allow me to introduce our first speaker, Juan Carlos Vargas. Juan is um, the principal and founder of Geo, uh, sorry, <laughs> is the founder of Geo Adaptive LLC based in Boston. And he got his DDES from GSD. And then after that, he was a lecturer at MIT for three years and uh, helped to found a lab in MIT focusing on the GIS technology application in economic analysis. So Juan, welcome. Good morning, everybody, and thanks so much for the invitation to be part of this um, very important anniversary event. Uh, this morning, rather than 
showing or sharing with you some of the work that we've been conducting. My interest is in uh, sharing from our perspectives and the, our professional practice uh, experience, how design research is being helping us create new entrepreneurship platforms that is allowing us to reconceive the way that as designers, we engage into issues of the landscape and basically the, the global, at the global scale issues of development. Um, for, for, for that, I would like to start basically how uh, I was interested in seeing the role of design research in large complex problems. Uh, we all are constantly bombarded uh, through media, uh, news, information, about the challenges uh, that we have globally. Hunger, uh, the failure of agriculture and food systems, uh, the failure of markets uh, and cities. Um, and all of this has basic clear evidence uh, that demonstrate um, our incapacity uh, to organize um, uh, forms to sustain life uh, on Earth. Uh, I was really, um, as an architect, urban designer, I was very, before coming to GSD, I was really puzzled by this, and, and like um, many others, basically disappointed and despair, basically, in seeing how our profession has reacted to these particular issues. Um, so w w I, I came to GSD interested in seeing basically how, as a designer, design research will help us address these big global challenges. What forms of research we will need to deploy to be able to address as designers in a community of interdisciplinary minds address these global issues? Um, at GSD and education at GSD allow me to basically um, explore the context of these big narratives. Uh, increasing awareness of complexity uh, the, in, 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 in many others that are on this slide, basically through discussions with colleagues in coursework across GSD. Carl Steinitz, my mentor and um, director, was very kind always to encourage me to cross campus constantly. I spent a year at the Kennedy School with decision makers understanding how they actually go about taking that knowledge into decision making at the policy level. Uh, I took courses on geostatistics in public health in Longwood, uh, or for instance, take courses in complex systems engineering at what now is the engineering school. And what I was always puzzled by that is this recognition that uh, this is not about domain knowledge like Peter was talking yesterday about, because we always will remain within those silos and no one can manage that amount of complexity by itself. But rather creating frameworks of thinking and inquiry in which basically heuristic thinking like Peter was mentioning last night can be brought to bear on these particular type of issues. And how we as designers will need to basically rethink the notion of product in this concept of incompleteness that we also discussed last night, basically moving from a product that is a static design to processes to support solutions uh, on this global scale. At GSD, I, was, I began wondering what kind of extent, uh, or to what extent is design involved, is involved in solving and delivering these kind of solutions, and who are the set of actors that basically have uh, an impact in these type of issues. Begin looking at institutions like World Bank, not with the interest of becoming a bureaucrat, but with the interest of seeing what type of scale and how they were relating multiple kind of issues. Uh, but also at uh, institutions like World Economic Forum in their systems initiative that, as you can see, basically relate to many of those initial uh, arguments that I brought um, at the beginning of the presentation closer home looking at issues of how landscapes can help us form a, uh, or create forums in which practice and research can help us address some of those issues. Yet, the big question remains of how many of those commissions uh, from similar agencies are captured by design research offices? And how many, if any, or what role do design graduates have in assisting or shaping these agencies and topics? Therefore, the, in the inevitable question was, how are we as designers depositing value meaningfully over these issues? The answer was basically, we need to uh, reformulate our value proposition uh, from design towards these problems. And just this being a small sample of the universe of, that may be out there, but 
basically reconceiving new models of design research practice, professional practice, uh, and relate that back to the pedagogical needs um, to, to begin basically looking at new opportunities. And these new opportunities were not the only ones looking in reformulating our position about this type of global issues. This is actually from the World Economic Forum as well, looking at the future of jobs. Um, in a technological era in which data is growing exponentially, uh, allowing us to even understand uh, better the level of complexities that we're dealing with, but basically also in a world in which algorithms basically tends to over-optimize everything and leave very little space for our or some kind of heuristic thinking. Peter was talking last night about, we're hoping that technology will not, or not any of us will think of technology will solve any of these issues. And I completely agree with him. But the question is, in this type of conceptual mapping about the roles of jobs or jobs in the future, is there a space for design research? As, not as a domain knowledge uh, container, but rather as an articulator of all of these entities. And this is not a demand from the design field either. This is actually coming from scientists as well. For instance, in the uh, 2000 article by Optum and Nassar, in which they actually, as scientists, argue about the role of design and design thinking in science creation. This is basically also rec recognizing that science has reached its plateau and level of precision about how we can address with these complex issues. Our perspective, uh, right of MIT, we spent off on a uh, research company. We didn't even know how to call ourselves at the beginning. We're not an engineering, we're not a management consultant, we're not a design, design company, we're not a landscape architecture company. So we call ourselves uh, basically research strategies. And research strategies to come and help basically organize frameworks of thinking about these global issues and forming a company basically to deal with these global issues, in which starting backwards from these big challenges and complex problems, create an entrepreneurship platform in which design, the designer, researcher, articulates a problem exploratory space in which through design research inquiry and heuristic thinking, we can actually uh, create a space for common uh, solution search and create that actionable knowledge that is needed at the decision maker uh, decision-making process and, and level, and, and move forward this level of, uh, 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 move forward these agendas of global development. In this particular area, one of our first commissions was working with the Inter-American Developing Bank. It's uh, very hard to convince um, uh, economists, uh, and Tony, I, I just apologize in advance about this comment uh, before the presentation, but it's very hard to convince um, econometrics uh, experts on the role of design in planning, for instance, for how you structure debt uh, to find infrastructure in, in cities of the global south. This is actually from the Inter-American Developing Bank, which we work with them, uh, one of our first commissions in 2010, 2011, in which our product was not a design for a city, an analysis for a city, was designing a framework of analysis around design research processes that will articulate engineers on hydrological modeling and chemists looking at uh, air quality and housing experts looking at subsidy structures uh, for the, to solve inequality issues. We designed one platform, one product, which was basically this process that grew from one city basically to uh, over 55 cities in more than 30 countries across Latin America and the Caribbean. For us, this is an area of opportunity for design research. Another one is, was working actually with the African Developing Bank, uh, looking at uh, multiple countries. This is also South African, um, so Sub-Saharan Africa in which we're looking at how issues of climate change, specifically drought, can be linked to macroeconomic modeling and uh, uh, economic modeling of, to, to understand basically how commodity prices globally may be affected by uh, drought globally and how that may affect uh, livelihood security, uh, food security, and even the structures in which the country provides their social services across this area uh, in Africa but also issues of how we help a country. This is actually for uh, Nicaragua, 
Uh, we're very interested in working in, in extremely poor areas. We're working right now in Nicaragua or Bangladesh, for instance, trying to create um, uh, strategies, processes in which they can strengthen their economic um, uh, progress uh, 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 policies. But in order to do that, we have, you know, we assemble teams of economists, anthropologists, ethnographers, uh, engineers, um, business administrators, all articulated through a design process and led and bad or lead by a designer, very much like any of us in the room, looking at issues, for instance, of economic complexity. This is from the Observatory of Economic Complexity at MIT and the Center for International Development at Harvard, where I actually spent there a year, and looking at how these global dynamics tend to change more dramatically the land use arrangements, and therefore how land use arrangements should recognize that global dynamics. Um, we recently also had the opportunity to work uh, with countries in Central America, for instance, through uh, a set of multilateral and multilateral organizations, trying to address the issues of how can we design a territorial strategy to minimize uh, the influx of um, children migrating to the United States, where the issues uh, may be more at home than anywhere else. In what type of conditions can we research to begin changing uh, those patterns of uh, migration? So we, we have, we, we're not, we, this is an experiment for us. It's an experiment that's been going on for about seven years. Um, we have now uh, three offices, in, one in Europe, South America, and Boston, and, and a team that is very diverse not only from the profession, but also from his cultural perspective. If we ought to be solving global issues in our DNA, we need to also have a uh, global representation. Uh, so it's, it's incredibly interesting to, to work from the design perspective with all of these um, um, experts. Our, our business model is not like that of many other large companies because we're rather small. So we don't divide ourselves in departments, the engineering department or the economist department. But we rather form ourselves in small teams, like very much like in a studio project. All those articulated, led by, or the process led by a designer. So we ask engineers and economists not to come and develop their models, but to help us create collective uh, interdisciplinary inquiries in which this becomes a narrative process rather than trying to achieve precision. So we wonder, you know, can design research reconceive its relationship with these global challenges uh, to expand the design process and find new venues to inform design intent? Um, is design very much contested or in our analysis, whatever that means and however it's evolving, blurring and therefore boundaries uh, uh, also in giving this uh, uh, a new opportunity for, to address these world complexities? And, or should we conceive uh, interdisciplinary analysis as a contemporary extension of a design research process? Uh, we believe that there is an opportunity to, um, to create uh, and conceive new business models uh, and roles for design researchers or res designers uh, leading uh, these processes in, in, in design pro and research. Uh, but basically, what we need to do is, is reconceive uh, entrepreneurship platforms to reconceive our value across um, the world. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Juan. Um, our next speaker is Narin Fia Wantana. Narin is the director of Atelier 10 Asia. She has been leading projects focusing on environmental design, daylighting, and facade optimization, as well as sustainable master planning. So, Narin, welcome. Uh, thank you, and thank you uh, for the GSEO to organize the event and for me to be, uh, to be also part of the panel, among with uh, also my colleague uh, Juan Carlos and Yvonne. Uh, we graduated around the same time, went through the same program actually, so nice to see them again. So from my session, I'm going to um, go through, just through the lens of me as an environmental designer, um, you know, what has been um, involved in terms of this uh, innovation, creativity, um, and then design entrepreneurship. 
But be, before we go anywhere, just a quick, I think, like just a quick background, because I think that will tell us also why um, I put together the presentation this way. Um, so I'm leading uh, Talia 10 office uh, in Asia Pacific region. Um, so for, for those of you who doesn't know who we are, we are an international environmental design consultancy firm. So similar to what Juan Carlos to say, uh, we, in the, we, we have interdisciplinary team, including architect, landscape, engineers, and also researcher, um, you know, to form this innovative design consulting um, field. So uh, just a quick background, you know, on how far, you know, I've come from graduating uh, from here about 10 years ago. So I was actually in uh, Atelier 10 US, the New York uh, office, uh, for five years um, before moving to Asia to open the Bangkok and then also now uh, Singapore office as well. So I run two, two offices, but then across uh, from, you know, from the left uh, to the right here is uh, all the projects that I've worked on. Not, not only this, actually more than 40 of them, these are just uh, selected fill um, that I that I selected uh, just to, to show you that I think like to to um, to kind of uh, address on what Martin say before is that the desk is definitely a doer I'm a doer so I uh, you know go out there and then make the project happens and then some of the project uh, happens to bring me back uh, including HBS master plan um, I was the one writing the framework um, to guide also the master plan uh, for HBS work um, so with that being said, so through through these three terms, um, you know, when I first got the, the assignment to to prep for this talk, I was kind of, what should I do? You know, how should I address um, the topic uh, in the right way? And what I didn't realize is exactly is that um, it's been what I've been doing every day, um, you know, throughout the past 10 years. This is exactly what Atelier 10, you know, is all about and what, what I've been working on. Uh, so just to kind of like, you know, show you the trend, I think this one kind of summarized what I've seen uh, again and again, you know, whether here in US or in Asia as well, it's been the same trend that it's always start, you know, with the legislate, uh, legislation that then chase, you know, the benchmark that we have set for, whether the code or any high performance uh, building benchmark. And then and then eventually uh, the benchmark, you know, is always pushing um, the, the market transformation in a way. Legislation will catch up eventually and that then leads uh, into the innovation process. It's kind of this cycle going on again and again, and I've seen it many, many times now um, throughout the past 10 years. So this one, just to illustrate you, um, it, it will be like four different stages uh, going across here. So of course, this is you know where we were before urbanism. Actually, um, when I did my uh, DDS here, my topic was on urbanization, urban heat island. Um, so you know before before then we were here. There was no not so much building, so much nature around um, with like good uh, outside um, social activity. Uh, and then you know when I graduate, it's you know become more ur urbanized. Um, so then sustainability was not, I don't think when I graduated about uh, 2007, was still the early, early era of sustainability, really difficult to actually address um, the subject to any designer. Um, not, not a catchy trend, definitely, I can tell you that. Um, so, so it was about like just, okay, how do you design good building? How do you design a high performance project? Um, so it's only selected, I would say, few clients, Howard being one of them, of course, um, you know, that, that try to push, you know, toward this trend. So you can see that uh, the, in terms of the exemplar performance project that we have uh, way back then, it was about that point. Then among the first project that I was working on, I think some of you recognize this building. Um, so this one is uh, Yale Forestry School uh, Kroon Hall. So I think it's one of the building that I think um, kind of like exemplified all, all the aspect of sustainability quite well. Uh, from the process, the beginning through uh, passive design, you know, all the way to including renewable and all. So this is, if you work on a project like this, I think you, you probably see this trend again and again. And now, you know, like in, into the carbon neutral and carbon positive is kind of like the trend that we're going forward to. Um, this one, just to show you the reason, is when we first uh, work on the project, the, the goal was actually to design a carbon neutral, a net uh, zero energy building. So of course, we were trying to push on all front in terms of the 
to get the, the energy down as much as possible, comparing to the baseline on the right in the blue uh, bar there. Um, so by the end, uh, of course, we reduce uh, the energy use by more than 30% or so, including renewable as well. But then the, that, that's not actually the most in, in interesting bit that I find for the project, because that, that's quite easy to do. I think the most interesting uh, thing that I find with this project is after the projects open and operate. That's when the challenge comes in, right? It's when you finish and then you start to operate the building. Um, we got a call uh, from Yale actually um, saying that the energy use is more than what we predicted. Is that a good thing? Probably not, um, you know. But what after investigation uh, with Yale, actually what we found now is it's not because we under predicted um, the building energy use, but rather because the project is so um, successful that everyone um, comes to study here, comes to work here. So it's if you compare in terms of the occupants that we set for early on um, and up until when the, when the building is actually open, uh, it's actually more. So by per square meter, we look at it from that perspective. It's uh, it's actually more than what we expected, but per occupant is actually yes, which leads to you know this kind of a design you know question that. This is this is like the unexpected event that you know no one wants it to happen, but then it it happens anyway. But I find it interesting because this is among the the first project that we come across of looking at energy use uh, per person rather than per area, and and now nowadays actually more and more of the project that I'm involving in uh, the. The clients actually asking us to looking at at both side per area to compare with the rest of the industry and then per person or per occupant um, to compare against the actual performance um, of the building. So that that's kind of where 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 the project were, and then you know moving forward then. In terms of what what I find also is uh, I think since I'm graduating you know from Michelle Addington was my committee member of course I have to talk about scale um, so this this next section is actually going to be mostly about uh, scale and then also I'm glad that Martin show uh, smart material because it's exactly what I'm going to touch upon because I was among I think the first uh, student group that uh, took the class uh, back in 2003 uh, to be exact so as as technology you know um, uh, evolved I think like it gets smaller, as we can tell from even smartphone. Um, I used to be so excited to even check my email, you know, inside the class here. But now, like we can check anywhere. So uh, as technology grows smaller, it actually has a. Uh, uh, bring out opportunity for us as designer because we have more space to play and then more space um, to kind of like uh, bring more green area back into the picture as well. Um, but back to there, um, so technology does also do do many, many things uh, for us as well, including computing time, I would say, from research analysis standpoint, what used to take like two days now takes like five minutes, which means that I can frame a uh, research question and run the process of analysis in terms of daylighting design, energy analysis in a more comprehensive way um, and, and on an annual basis as well. So that's quite important. Um, so again, uh, for the for the course that we took away back then in terms of smart material. Uh, so one of the things that I, I find uh, interesting back then was LED, which I have to say that even to complete a circuit back then was really, really tough and expensive as well. And now, uh, now we, I, I'm pretty sure that all of you just since this, this morning have touched more than and five, you know, device that has LED on it. So it becomes kind of the norm. But I think it's interesting to see, like, within the past uh, five years, how far, uh, within the past 10 years, how far the technology has come. One of the projects that kind of highlight this aspect quite well uh, for us was a temporary um, pavilion in Shanghai Expo. This one was in 2010. Um, so this one is a British pavilion. Um, all of you might recognize it's supposed to look like a British flag as well from afar. So these are spike. Um, and within the spike, it actually has a meaning. Uh, so within the spike, you can see here that there are seats, um, you know, within uh, within the spike. But then the reason that I brought this up was not because of the spike or the, the seat, but rather the technology driven. So without LED, uh, you would not be able to create an effect, you know, like this, which is like to the to the mini uh, kind of control, you know, in terms of creating the lighting effect. And then from afar, it then becomes look like a fiber optics, um, you know, kind of like a 
at an event, so it's quite a spectacular. So this one has to do with, uh, with the scale of technology that we've come far along. But that then uh, opened up also the opportunity um, to, to the next chapter, I would say, which is now that everything becomes so small, it opened up so much land, so it becomes back to where we were, right? So now it's kind of what I find interesting within the past 10 years, we go from, from you know, just ground house to urbanism, so then back to then, let's bring back the nature, let's bring back ecology, back, back to the picture. And I think living in Asia, also uh, two other aspects that, uh, that I want to address um, is on the well-being design aspect, is also another, another trend that we talk a lot. And of course, people have to spend time outdoor you know, with nature that would then uh, make them be more happy and healthy. And, and the other aspect is also intergenerational, so not to design only for just one generation, but more than now it's up to four generations, is like the baseline uh, for, for us um, in terms of the practice. So the, the um, in terms of, you know, I think this one you've seen before, like how uh, in terms of sustainability design and smart city design, um, back to also uh, in terms of the operation and maintenance is also quite important. Um, and I think also more and more um, from early on that I address uh, the building centric, right? So now it becomes more on actually human centric is quite um, the, the trend that, that I've, we've come along to. And then more and more that we have to work on sustainability master plan for projects. So these are kind of just uh, quite a few category that we have to touch upon. I have to say that the more I work on the project in this field in terms of research, the more category grows. This, I would say, is probably outdated already. Now we have to touch upon nature, um, happiness, and then also um, not only for just human, but rather for all well-being, which means uh, that's including plants as well as animals. Um, so that's, that seems to be what, what we're driving toward. The last project that I'm gonna show, this one is gonna get into more of the, the research base, uh, is Gardens by the Bay, which is uh, based in Singapore. So this one is, uh, is an outdoor garden with two conservatory. One uh, is a flower dome and the other one is a, is a cloud dome. Um, so it's quite a huge uh, pr a public sector project um, in Singapore. If you visit Singapore, this is one of the things that you definitely have to go to. Uh, so this one is the flower dome and then uh, the cloud dome, so two different uh, conservatory kind of idea. But the, the things that drive behind this whole wheel is actually the idea of how do you then create a so-called this kind of uh, environment, right? Which, of course, it looks at it, it's gonna use lots of energy. Um, Singapore, the moment you land, this will be uh, the, pic the picture feel, you know, going out from Changi Airport um, to any destination you want, you will see lots of trees. So one of the fuel source uh, that we use uh, for the project is actually coming from this tree clippings. Um, this one was from the coordination with N Park, uh, which runs um, the in terms of the, all the, the park. Um, in Singapore. And the, the whole energy cycle, this one's kind of summarized uh, the whole idea of the project. So we start upon uh, on that side. So from the energy generation, bringing in the, the tree clippings as a source for biomass, you know, to feed into all the absorption chiller and then running the electric chiller. So these two then pumps uh, the, the chill water back uh, to the conservatory. And then one of the things, given that it's a flat land, it's a landscape that you cannot have chimney, you cannot have cooling tower, so that becomes then a challenge uh, for us. So we have to work with the designer on how to hide uh, this uh, chimney um, through what we call super trees, uh, which you can see right there. Um, and, then, uh, and then also in the, in the overall uh, ideas to recirculate the water was also another thing um, that, that drives behind uh, the, the concept of the project. So uh, in terms of the other, I think in terms of the research uh, driven portion, I think this one took us quite a while and now I'm working actually on the third third generation project um, of this one. So after this one complete, we have two more suggestions. But just to show you kind of a research trend is that, so when, you, when you're in a tropical region, right, it's quite hot, the sun is in a high angle. So lots of sun's coming in, you need to cool down the inside. So what do we do? Uh, so we, you know, in terms of the, the computer generation, the simulation, we can frame the study. And I have to say that uh, DDoS, one of the, one of the things that I got out and I'm still using it every single day um, for DDoS program is how to frame the question. I know that uh, I, I think like, you know, being a DDoS student, the thing that I hate the most is if someone asks me like, what's your thesis question? How do you frame your thesis question? Actually, you know, it's, it's 
it's going to become your tool, you know, after graduation, is, and I use it every day. So for this project, we frame how do we control the daylight. What you see here is actually the daylight distribution at a, at a certain hours um, throughout the year. So the, the higher the yellow zone means uh, the more daylight hours, which is what you need to grow the plants underneath the dome. Um, talking about innovation, I have to say, uh, tie with also um, the technology is that uh, the 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 running of the simulation uh, takes so much uh, less time now. Um, so just uh, so this one is kind of to show uh, the shading. So once you have to control the daylight, and then um, you know the daylight comes through, and then you cut the the daylighting load. Um, and then this one just showing uh, simulation showing the the daylight uh, at a certain lux hour that we need to maintain uh, throughout the years. Uh, so to create the effect, something like this, uh, I didn't quite get in terms of you know the the concept up until this past uh, month actually with the Sakura season. So the the gardens by the bay has to control the light uh, through the shading design. Um, so this one is kind of the the ending, and then uh, the, the the project actually was driving for carbon neutral. So so we actually achieve it. Um, which, which means that we use less uh, power than what we were generating for. But looking forward uh, to the trend of uh, where we're going um, is that the, the, we're going into, I think, like a, the, the next trend that I would say if I have to come from the DDES uh, 40th anniversary, it's going to be more in terms of resilient, uh, restorative, and regeneration now because I think we've, we've come to that point where we can definitely make a sustainable development, but how do we make it sustain by itself? You know, and being close to nature, I think, is the is the next step in the research field uh, in terms of sustainability. Um, so that's that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you, Naren, for your presentation. Our next speaker is Jenny Clifford. Jenny leads a 20-person Hawaii-based design firm founded in 2008 with a passion for creative problem solving in a collaborative think tank environment. Her firm is the commission recipient for the planning and design of the late senator and president Pro Tem Daniel Yuyan Library in collaboration with Paycop Freed and Partners. And Jenny is the co-editor of the award-winning book, which uh, she will mention in her uh, presentation. And also she is a former AIA Honolulu Award of Excellent recipient. So Jenny, uh, come to the podium. Thank you, Bing, and to Martin. Um, I do believe that I am one of the 41 green dots on your 180 dot chart. Um, definitely, my focus has been on the doing of things. And all those years that I came to the GSD, I really thought that I had come to learn about housing, but under the guidance of my mentors, Peter Rowe and Spiro Palalis, and later Jeff Huang, I realized that that was not really to be the case. So as you may or may not know, my DDA's Harvard experience was somewhat unique. Some would say it was actually singular, and at least at the time it was. Um, I was the GSD's first experimental, remote, distant doctoral candidate. Um, at a time when um, uh, broadband was just a discussion, and perhaps uh, the best way to video conference was using H323 technology, and GoToMeeting didn't exist, and Autodesk was experimenting with uh, um, digital drawing across great distances. So I actually taught later on with Alex Krieger, um, Urban Design Studio from Honolulu. So I'm that little red dot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on, on the turning globe. So this is me uh, on a CRT, I believe, uh, in Jeff Wang's class. I believe Jeff is here today. Um, my final focus was on thoughts of how the coming broadband internet technology might affect the way we live. I thought at the time that places we choose to live would become less structured, more diffuse, and less dictated by, by how we make a living. 
Little did I realize that this notion would actually trickle down to even the way we choose to live from room to room. We started Clifford Planning and Architecture seven years ago with just three of us. Today we're a firm of 20 functioning vertically and organized vertically, working at different scales on different kinds of projects. Thus we are na uh, Re Revit natives. We embraced Revit from the very start. Um, we brought vis the visualization process in house such that it really is truly a design tool. Um, we also found that to collaborate graphically and communicate across great distances regularly and seamlessly was inv an invaluable asset. Our research-based design bleeds over into the publishing realm. So in addition to editing a book on unique stonework in Hawaii and providing the base research for a book on heartwood, um, our firm is also the editor for a book series published by the nonprofit arm of the AIA in Hawaii. The experimental research-based nature of my GSD experience and our design thinking perspective of problem solving permeates actually everything we do on almost a daily basis. We have and continue to collaborate with our local university and high schools to not only teach but to be informed. We find this interact interaction both refreshing and thought-provoking. Young minds are very interesting. So this happens to the, be the American Samoa Community College, where I worked with a team of young women mostly from uh, the University of Hawaii uh, to develop for the American Samoa Community College a long-range master plan. So with this master plan, they actually won reaccreditation as the only baccalaureate degree in the entire Pacific region. One of the things we did was we immersed ourselves in the culture and I believe that good design and good research begins with being accepted by the people who are your stakeholders. So later on, years later, um, our firm was awarded the jewel of the master plan, which is the American Samoa Performing Arts Center. And so this is it under construction. Um, working in a somewhat, even though it's the territory of the United States, somewhat third world status, we brought with us a lot of technologies from America which were quite unfamiliar. And so there, was a, there is this ongoing learning experience and we're um, approaching, I think, the last six months of construction. So we will do not only the master plan, but the architecture and then the interiors. So we found that our clients come back to us repeatedly as we change scales to pull through our design thinking process through to the end to an operable facility. So one of the tools we use um, being uh, early adopters of new technology, not knowing any better sometimes, um, it was hard to explain to the village elders what their building was going to look like. They couldn't really understand the drawings and even the, the beautiful renderings that we did photorealistically. So we borrowed a program from the gaming industry. And so this is, uh, this is, oh, sorry. This is uh, the drawing and using QR scan codes, we developed their actual building for them. And so with an iPhone, we'd hand them the iPhone and they can zoom in and actually go through their building uh, and experience a little bit more on a one-to-one -one basis. So this is another project in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, it's 14 acres and what we did is we set aside half of the site, which has a beautiful stream running through it. And living on an island, you would guess that sustainability for us is a huge issue. Um, so the developer could have built 200 housing units on this same lot. And what we did is we modeled for him this idea of treading very lightly on the land, preserving nature, and turning what this, this um, half of the site into what will be a urban garden in perpetuity. So he used our digital images to convince the county and to convince 24 very lucky people that this was a great idea and much better than, than sort of a high density development. 
So these are our in-house renderings, uh, some of them, uh, of what, what living in the forest, sort of above the tree canopy, might look like. And then again, we did uh, the interiors. So this is a complete residence on the right and fully furnished and some of our thoughts in the beginning on the left. And then our image of our rendered uh, home on the left and then the actual construction. And as you can see, the landscaping hasn't quite grown in yet to match our original renderings. So we also take that concept into the retail arena. And what we've learned is that Revit and being able to sort of create photorealistic images on demand has turned our entire construction drawing system upside down on its head, if you will. So these are our early images as opposed to our very last, which is more normal in the construction industry. Um, and what we find ourselves doing is then backing ourselves into sort of the promise of a vision for our clients. So this is a hotel that we're working on right now. And what you see on the walls is um, these very interesting ceramic pieces. So we have a client from Japan who brought us these ceramic pieces that they make. And they put them on the table and said, what can you do with this? So what we did is we turned um, the pieces stacked on end with steel rods through them into uh, a light screen. So outside is the ocean on Waikiki Beach. We clad their walls. We did some punched elements. And uh, this, this is, uh, we just started demolition work on this. So we still hand draw, and it's interesting the interplay of hand drawing to photorealism. And one of the things I notice is it does keep you quite honest. So the other thing we do as a result of the work that we do at multiple scales is we furnish our own, our own work. So these are some of the units. The upper left is actually a rendering, and the lower three are some of our finished products. I was very fortunate to have worked with Gensler in San Francisco under their concept of a one studio. Being able to collaborate seamlessly across great distances, especially if you live 2,500 miles from anybody else, is, is almost a necessity today. Um, so locally, we built 810,000 square feet in a Revit model, including the mechanical and electrical systems which formed the basis for this high performance, um, green um, renovation project of the federal building. So um, these are heat studies, light studies. We cut sections through the BIM model. It became a way to uh, represent digitally to a broad constituency um, what their building might look like at the end. These are some finished uh, photographs. Um, the other thing we like to do is we like to take a sort of a urban planning approach to architecture, bringing this notion that stakeholders have great ideas. And we like to include the university when we can. So as Bing mentioned, we were, we were very honored to be awarded the commission of the late senator's uh, library in Hawaii. And we worked with Pei Cobb Fried. And we started out with a very large stakeholder meeting in which we asked the simple question, well, what did the senator mean to you? And what we came out with collaboratively is this idea of a transparent building and that uh, a great learning center for democracy is about being transparent and to let the world in. So the building is a representation of that basic concept. So everyone thinks that we live in paradise and that um, um, it's always wonderful and it's, it, and, uh, it's, it's a lot of people's dream to come and visit uh, Hawaii. But we now have become the state with the largest per capita of homeless in the country. So the state estimates that for every 10 people who live be below the 30% AMI, which is the poverty level in Hawaii, that 
there are only 2.9 places for them to even consider to live in. So we have a housing shortage of about somewhere between 18,000 to 30,000 units. And depending on who you talk to, that, that number is somewhere in between. And last year, we produced only 3,300 units. So it's a big issue, forefront of sustainability conversations in Hawaii. So what we're most proud of is these are sub 800 square foot housing units that we're doing for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And they're prefabricated. Um, we're hoping to turn them into kit parts. And we know that everyone around the globe is studying this, but we think we've come up with some really innovative ideas that actually makes it doable as opposed to theoretical. So we believe in place. We believe in adding, adding um, uh, culture to a place and to being mindful and respectful. And so one of the, the most precious things to me is that we, we always consider and add value that way. So this is our current, one of our current projects. We're doing the first micro-housing unit project, a large-scale micro-housing unit project in Hawaii. So we're doing 508 units in four towers. And to do this, um, of course, we started with the land planning. And so this, again, is our Revit model. Um, and to do affordable housing on an island is, is a daunting task at best. So what we did is we brought in new technology, so comm slabs and delta beams, which might be sort of commonplace in, a, in the continental United States, but certainly not in Hawaii. And what it has allowed us to do is to speed up the construction process where we're pouring a slab every nine days. So a floor in our towers every nine days. And to show how this whole um, series of towers might might fit into the environment, we actually print early on our, our own 3D, studio, uh, 3D study models. So we have this, uh, we brought the technology into our office. We run three machines at one time to produce models. And someday my hope and dream is to have a machine that we could, you know, actually print building parts. So we can study um, skins and facades and very quickly, very early on in the process. And this is just a small smattering of all the different ways we looked at how the buildings could be designed. And then, of course, we will end up doing the interiors as well. So here are our delta beams and comms labs. And our, our project is actually under construction. And what I'm also very pleased about is this is our very first tower crane, so we're all very excited for our firm. And we're always looking for young, bright minds who think like us. And if you like to be warm and work in a place that's sunny, <laughs> come look for us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ginny. Um, our next and last speaker is Ivan Panashev. Ivan is a serial entrepreneur. Um, he, he is currently co-founder and chief product officer at Infa Corporation, where he is responsible for product development and design. Before that, he served as a senior platform manager at Autodesk BIM 360 Cloud Products Groups, and he was co-founder, CTO, and chairman of Horizontal System Corporation, which was sold to Autodesk. Um, also during uh, his part-time, uh, he has also co-authored two books uh, with regard to how building technology can be, you know, applied in the cloud system, being published by uh, uh, McGraw-Hill uh, publisher. So, Ivan, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and thanks, uh, DDS community, for, for inviting me back. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a serial 
entrepreneur. Um, I, I have I've started a couple of companies, but just like kids, they're all different. And maybe unless you have five or more, <laughs> they're, they're each individual and, and very, very uh, different. So uh, today I only have five slides and I wanted to share a, a personal story with, with you and how it sort of defined uh, what, I, what I'm doing um, and what I expect to, to continue to be doing uh, in, in, in the future. Uh, so just uh, to add some, some color to what uh, being uh, mentioned. So I, I, I'll describe myself, uh, myself in, in three words. Uh, I consider myself a constant learner. I'm a total news junkie, so I read everything from the Wall Street Journal to, to BuzzFeed and to uh, the fake news uh, that, are, that are hitting us all the time. Uh, I love it. It's just a different point of view. And I'm also a technologist, so I, I like to learn about new technologies, and I'm always fascinated with new, with new technologies. So I graduated Harvard College in 2000, and if you remember what happened in 2000, the dot-com crash, right? So a uh, great year to go into the, into the job market. Uh, I managed to, to navigate uh, somehow, and I ended up uh, working at a small consulting firm actually here in, in Cambridge. And we, we co-authored several books uh, published by McGraw-Hill on new uh, building technologies. Um, and then I, I, my, my training uh, is in engineering, so I also co-authored several engineering standards on new construction methods, uh, specifically around uh, concrete and, and steel construction for uh, residential use. So th this was before uh, the, the GSD. And then at the GSD, my dissertation was on building information modeling, and I'm class of uh, 08. So if you remember what happened in 08, another <laughs> economic meltdown. So great, uh, another another great year um, to 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 jump into uh, into the real world. I would call it. Um, so I mean the. There are a lot of a lot of things that that you can that you can learn um, during during uh, the, these times. Uh, I was just curious to to understand the intersection uh, of um, industry, academia, and I, I also very was very curious to learn from from my from my peers. And I know that uh, since I'm going through Harvard, I know that just the peers you learn as much from your peers as you would from your advisors or uh, both internal and external. And uh, one of my favorite um, corporate slogans, maybe you can recognize this, but you can accomplish a lot or you can become better through research. I mean, this, this one in particular is about sound, so better sound through research. Uh, but I, I um, fundamentally believe that, uh, yes, you can certainly contribute uh, to uh, to the academic community or to industry through research, but also you enrich yourself by doing research. So it's, uh, for me, it's, it's a very uh, personal thing, um, how, I mean, the process of, of learning uh, through research. So, so here is the story that I, that I wanted to share. So uh, it was, again, uh, during my uh, DDES years here, here at the GSD, uh, and it was almost, so I was, when I was asked to, to present, I was going through my, through my archive and I was wondering, okay, so what, I was, what was I actually doing <laughs> at the GSD? <laughs> and by flipping through various photos, of course, with my classmates and so on and so forth, I found this amazing email. So almost 10 years ago, uh, sent on Friday, June 1st, 2007, okay, to Ivan Panushev, okay, copying to others. And then I remembered, okay, this was, I think, after one of my uh, uh, thesis committee meetings uh, with both uh, internal and external advisors. And when I opened this email, uh, I didn't have a good feeling. I, I didn't think this, this was after one of those good, good meetings. So then I, I continued reading. So the subject, notes from meeting slash further action. So I'm, I'm always a fan of, of action, so I'm always interested in, okay, how can we make something better? How can we uh, improve? Importance high. How often do you receive emails with high importance? Once a month, once every three months. This was exciting. So of course you have to continue reading. So Ivan, thanks for the notes. Okay, great. 
I hope that I don't offend or discourage, but I wanted you to have it before the weekend so that you could contemplate. Of course, it's Friday night. It's Friday night. It's amazing. <laughs> of course, uh, we, we love to, to contemplate, and it, it is great. I mean, this is, this is amazing. Um, and it continues, right? Of course, it, it was one of those that you have to scroll multiple times. Uh, and I have not altered anything. Right, so these are, these, are direct, these are direct quotes. It continues. So there is no mode of inquiry. There are no juicy questions to be wrestled with. There are no findings. Where are Ivan's original contributions? Where is the academic intellectual contribution? <laughs> that was great, that was great. This is, this is very much in the spirit, right, of, of the GSD, and, and this is how we learn, right? This is how we, we improve, this is how we push ourselves to, uh, to, to dig deeper and, and, to, um, and to learn more. Well, it continues. <laughs> I don't think I saw any original data. Well, I, I was two years into my dissertation, uh, one year uh, from my graduation. It was great. No, I had to, I had to get my, my act together, right? And it continues. <laughs> <laughs> I fear that we're getting to the point of the machine returns, where the chore is frustrating for you and for us. I, I <laughs> yes, we're totally in the same in the same boat. So uh, <laughs> unless something changed, yes, this will have been very frustrating. But at the end, I hope this is useful and thought-provoking in a positive and forward-thinking way. It was indeed. It was that that was. I think uh, that was that was great. Best regards. <laughs> It's perfect for a Friday night, yes. <laughs> so, um, yes, it's, it's one of these moments that I'm sure every one of you have been on one side or the other, right? Yeah. Giving this criticism or receiving it. it it's amazing. This, this, is how we, this is how we evolve, this is how we work together, and this is how we sort of push each other to, to achieve more. So I, I made it, right? So I graduated. <laughs> <laughs> So I graduated, um, I did two postdocs, Columbia, Georgia Tech. I co-authored a couple of chapters of the National BIM Standard. So maybe something original came out of this, most likely after the, most likely after the email. I co-founded three companies, uh, including one with fellow DDS alumni that uh, you might know, Jordan Brandt of my class and David Del Villar. Okay, so that company, Horizontal Systems, was acquired by, by Autodesk. Um, and it was uh, the, the foundation of uh, their cloud BIM offering called BIM 360, and together with several other acquisitions, um, actually the, the CEO of, of Autodesk at one of the investor meetings said that this was the fastest selling product in the history of the company. So that was, that was exciting to be, to be part of that. Um, I co-invested also in a couple of startups, including one um, by a, a GSD uh, graduate. Currently, my company is called Infer, uh, and it has nothing to do with uh, design. So what we do is we enable companies to run computations on encrypted data. So uh, how can you run some advanced uh, operations and, and functions on data that you cannot see? So very applicable in a variety of, of industries, including healthcare, finance, uh, Internet of Things, and, and so on. Um, but what are, if, if I can summarize quickly the, uh, the learnings in particular, I think the key word that I want to emphasize is uh, co, right? So co-authored, co-founded. So this is something that, that we learn here, right? So collaborating together, uh, working on a, on a project, uh, having, a, having a joint mission, and, and sharing both the, the good and the bad uh, the, of the experience. Resilience. Right, so working or graduating rather in uh, 2000 and 2008 uh, teaches you something. So raising money in 2008 was not easy. Even 2009, uh, I mean, when the when the stock market goes down 30 or 40 percent, nobody is investing in high-risk uh, companies. Um, so this this really 
uh, taught us a lot. And, and all, I also learned to, to play outside the, the sandbox, right? So testing something, testing something new, um, learning from, from the mistakes and, and iterating. So this is, uh, this is something interesting, right? So uh, these, are, these are things that I, that I try to take into, uh, into everything uh, I do. And then I, I would like to summarize quickly before we transition to the, to the panel discussion, um, some, of the, some, of the, some of the high level uh, learnings. So I, I really noticed over the past 10 years since I've been in, uh, in the space that the emergence of what I would call engineer designer. Uh, so somebody who is an engineer by training but is curious about design. And I'm not talking about designers with technical skills, right? So they're different, but somebody who is trained as an engineer but uh, is, is very interested in, uh, in design. And I, I find that uh, these people are starting to be appreciated, so that's exciting. Um, I learned that building a product-focused company is different than project-focused, right? So we heard a lot about projects, and this is great, and, and we've been trained to work on big projects, put them together multiple years, and then we deliver them, and it is amazing. Uh, but the Product-focused company is, is very different, right? Because you create something that is very individual. Uh, I mean, my previous company, we created software, right? That is being used on uh, someone's iPad, right? So it's, very, it's a very personal experience you're designing for the, for the individual as opposed to the, uh, uh, to, to the group. And um, also, the way that you approach design is, uh, is different if you want to achieve um, replication and, and scale, right, in a, in a product-focused company. Project focus is, really, is rarely about um, repeatability, right, because it, it's not very likely that, that you would uh, do the exact same project um, over and over again. Uh, I also learned that, that in the future, and even right now, uh, data will teach us a lot about design. So I think that that is an opportunity that maybe we haven't uh, tapped into enough. Uh, I have another bullet point uh, um, about a different angle uh, of, of data, but what can we actually learn from all the data that we're collecting, right? Um, and well, we know that uh, we're monitoring uh, spaces, we're monitoring roads, um, our post is captured and, and beamed to the, to the cloud so we can really understand how we, uh, for example, feel when we experience a space or, or something else. So this is, this is exciting. What can we actually learn and how can we uh, improve design by using, uh, by using data? I have also noticed in my experience that design focus really drives company evaluations. And again, I'm talking about startup space. Um, I've, I've noticed that um, currently, if you are design focused and you specifically go after um, like a specific problem that you're trying to solve uh, through design, uh, you you get special attention from from investors. I mean, even I, I've talked to venture capital firms that they have a design partner. I don't know if 20 or 30 years ago, uh, a VC firm would have a design partner. That's that's amazing. Um, well, oh, this wasn't the case 2008. <laughs> Let me clarify, this, was, this is amazing to see. And I'm also noticing a bigger divide between uh, bespoke, right, custom design and design for the, for the billions, right? So, um, again, this, this goes back to the, to the teachings, especially at, at the GSD, uh, and we do a great job in, in teaching uh, design that is, that is very unique, that is iconic, and so on. But uh, just as impactful is uh, the, the personal design that would uh, ex be experienced by, by billions, right? So maybe this is an untapped opportunity. Uh, I don't know, uh, for, special, for special attention in, in the future. And I'm seeing actually closer relationship between, uh, or the opportunity for closer relationship between data science and design. So by data science, I mean uh, learnings from data. Right? Not just the data itself, but what are the questions that you can ask a, a data scientist? Uh, and this is something that my, my co, uh, fellow co-presenters uh, mentioned. What are the, some, some of the insightful questions that you can ask of the data that would inform your design in the future? 
right? And, and these might be uh, very basic questions. They might be more fundamental questions, but considering that we're tra uh, tracking everything from uh, traffic, right, uh, and, and road use, um, how can we use that to actually inform our design decisions? And also, for example, in uh, product design, so we would, we would come up with something, and I'm talking about uh, software, uh, we, would, we would come up with, with a design, even before it's finished, we would like uh, um, users to experience it so we can iterate and improve. Well, this doesn't really apply to the, um, uh, to the, to the building scale, right, or the urban scale. But the question is why not, right? Can't we allow others to experience um, design at, at, at the physical scale and uh, still refine and, and improve it? Um, and I would like to, to end on, on a note uh, that is, uh, I'm trying to realize recently that other industries are actually trying to transition to more ad hoc and agile ways of work similar to what we are uh, actually doing in the, uh, in the design and, and, the, and the building industry. So I just came back two weeks ago uh, from a week of uh, meetings with, with major banks in, in Europe, and they are uh, restructuring the entire organizations to be more agile, right? Smaller teams, uh, they, they will have something like a product owner uh, for each team that will deliver a specific uh, product, which might be a function, it's a bank, a designer dedicated to this team, then teams organized in something that they call tribes and so on and so forth. Uh, so they can, uh, this would allow them to quickly put together teams, deliver a project, then reconfigure teams, deliver other projects. So actually we think that our industry is very inefficient and uh, disorganized, we can't really manage and deliver big projects. Actually other industries are trying to, uh, to adopt what, what we are doing to some extent, in order to be more agile and uh, flexible. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Um, in the brochure, uh, you see that Professor Alex Krieger is listed as a, a respondent to this panel because of uh, family uh, urgent matters, uh, so Alex uh, cannot be here. So last minute, um, Professor Ali Mokawi uh, very graciously agreed to join us as a faculty respondent. So uh, Ali is the professor of architecture technology here at the GSD. He is also the founding director of the Harvard Center for Green Cities and Buildings. So, Ali, welcome. All right, thank you. Can we have more light? Oh, all right. <laughs> it's very difficult to see you, but we'll uh, try to make the connection between the four. Uh, my job is relatively easy. Uh, compared to the people who presented. So I'm, trying, I'm just going to try to make the connections somehow. Uh, Peter actually made it extremely easy for me uh, since last night he spoke about design thinking. And in many different ways, it's the way that I started my career, which is really related to AI. And Herbert Simon um, has been, in a way, a connector, trying to figure out how science is connected to economics, how things uh, from uh, the scale of nano is connected to the urban, and so on and so forth. So in many different ways, the description, the theoretical descriptions that we've heard yesterday in relation to what Herbert Simon spoke about and what basically uh, Peter articulated so well is the foundation of what these uh, four fellows have been basically discussing this morning, right? And uh, in very simple terms, I'm going to try to very gently see if we can just see the connections. I'm pretty sure it's, it's so obvious to all of you. One is the uh, one discussed the topic of design and complex systems. It's a great, actually, uh, connector, right? Because this is exactly what the, the, the three has been discussing, the, 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 the three uh, other presenters. He spoke about en the engineering way of problem solving, which is really fundamental. This, uh, there is a fundamental distinction between it, as well as design thinking in what we are trying to solve in, in what we call the ill 
design problems and what Peter also uh, uh, reiterated yesterday and spoke about the, the, the uh, he called it, and it's been called, the wicked problems, right? Which is really what we, what we try to, to, to solve in, in, in design. In, in many different ways, we can see the outcome of this from an educational perspective is creating or educating the strategist, right? How would we educate the strategist? And, and um, one described uh, a nice, actually, articulation of, the, uh, of that description in relation to a practice, right? Trying to figure out what it is that we can do once you are really learned as well as once you, once you become a strategist. This has been converted into, in a way, the three other presenters converted from the point of view of, 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 of their own um, a practice. Um, Nari, in a way, is describing, although um, one said, you know, domain uh, or domain specific solutions is perhaps not as necessary. At the, at the end of the day, once you become a strategist, Nery described a different way of doing it. Really, the, the, the domain or the, the knowledge domain becomes extremely important, right? You're still a strategist. And that's actually a definition, which is a very interesting one, a definition that particular practice of, of a need that has been um, generated by um, the lack of the architect's knowledge, fundamental knowledge as well as expertise in the environmental issues and the void that has been created over the past 20 years between the engineers, the architects, as well as the push by the, by the users since these environmental issues have been, has been highlighted that we would need really this project that's going to be translated into, into environmental solutions. So the void has been created, right? And you've got a strategist as well as solutions to those strategies that has been, has been articulated by companies. One of these companies is Atelier 10, right? Nico is not with us here, but he was one of the original founders uh, of, of that company. He's a DDES graduate. Um, again, a fantastic example of a strategy, right? Void, uh, back into one's description that re really articulating a need Right? And that need is, is basically uh, not just in the United States, but globally, it's very niche. But in this particular case, it's really related to a domain-specific uh, subject, as well as um, knowledge that needs to be there. But the knowledge itself is good to articulate a need, but at the same time, being on the higher level of the understanding of what needs to be done becomes very important. Education, great, be this, right? Uh, Jenny. Remote learning, right? Remote learning. This is the time actually where Spiro Polalis invited me to come to uh, Harvard. I think 98 or 99. I met before that, I think a few years before that, uh, Michelle Addington in a conference we were talking about it yesterday. It's in Morocco. Uh, connections, I was sitting in Michigan doing things that are related to augmented reality and virtual reality and, and the technologies. It's all connected 1995, 1996. Before that, I was engaged with AI and so on and so forth. So Spiro said, you know, we've got a, we, want to we want to teach a class on simulation, right? I'm sitting in Michigan. He said, one way to do it, I think this is, seems to me I'm now trying to see the connections there. He said, why don't you do it using um, remote uh, conferencing? I said, well, it's going to be difficult. Let's try it. We tried it a couple times. It did not work, so we did this. Uh, flying in and out. But the point is here um, with what Jenny described is this technology that has been very important to the learning process in the uh, late 1990s being translated again, strategist, but from the lo global to the local, right? So the engagement of her pra practice of the local issues from the point of view of social, sustainability, sense of, sense of place, became so important to that practice. Hence, the basically um, uh, finding that opportunity and flourishing that particular practice at the same time, utilizing that technology, the technology that has learned as well as the love of it as, as she continued, I'm assuming that's the case, right, uh, in, in, in the development of that practice. But 
I think if I, if I see something that's very important there is global versus local and, and the engagement there that has been created in her practice, again, being a strategist. Ivan, um, um, opportunities, right? Uh, 2000, 2008, really those are breaking points. At the same time, they can be fantastic times, right? Depending on how you see it. Uh, seeing it as a strategist, uh, opportunities that's being created, being an entrepreneur, all of these can be semantics in a way, but we can dig in deeper into the details of those. But at the end of the day, the educational aspects of it become so important. An engineer uh, or engineering related design thinking, uh, looking at it from an abstractions perspective, a lot of opportunities. Been using a lot of different terms that are almost similar, depending on how you, how you see it, right? I see the world in different ways. It depends, on, it depends on, on, your, on your glasses and the lenses that you see them. From an abstraction, the brain is the same, right? All of, uh, everybody is, has uh, that intellect. The educational aspects becomes extremely important. Now back into the idea of, of the lenses. He, he spoke about testing, learning, feedback loops. I see that in, when I if I'm writing computer program in AI, right? We're seeing it with uh, what Peter talked about yesterday, uh, which, which is the issue of heuristics, right? Uh, and being able to solve complex problems, complex problems that are not engineering related, that are well-defined, but ill-defined, right? Again, repetition of the same ideas in terms of where things went from uh, coming to the school with uh, some sets of tools and then uh, my, my assumption is that learning education at that time elevated that by asking the right questions as well as abstracting it in a way that can be applicable to different areas, right? So the domain in a way becomes irrelevant except in some instances it becomes very, very, very relevant since you can connect it to, to the opportunities that exist as well as the value that you'll be creating. So he spoke about, uh, actually, we can see it in multiple scales, multiple dimensions, different hierarchies. Uh, we've, uh, uh, we've seen also keywords that are uh, products versus project. You, you, uh, Ivan did uh, uh, the, his, his company is based on pr products. The others are looking at it in terms of projects, right? Same thing, right, from an abstraction perspective. So the, the bottom line is the following. I think the issue of, of abstraction becomes extremely important as well as uh, uh, inherently a part of the, uh, I think, the push that we would like to have. And we, we've been trying to accomplish that with the DDES. And uh, just historically, we've, been, we, we, we've, we've heard many different, um, uh, or at least a fantastic, act, I have to admit, uh, uh, recall of the history of the DDES and its connection to the PhD. I come in from a background of PhD. I headed the PhD program at the University of Pennsylvania. I come here and we said, well, you know what, we've got to have to establish a PhD program here in, in technology. Actually, that ended up defining better, at least from my point of view, from a technology perspective, the difference between DDES and PhD, which has been articulated so well in relation to its link to design and the practical aspects of it and its its, uh, its connection to, um, uh, to, to the educational mission of what we do. So having said uh, what I said, I'm not going to open any questions. I'm going to basically bring it back to uh, Bing Wang, and uh, she'll be moderating the discussion. So thank you so much. I've seen uh, many uh, colleagues uh, of the DDES, as well as friends, some students. It's, uh, it's a fantastic program. It's uh, actually, this has been Great opportunity for me just to say hello to all of you and welcome you back to Harvard. Can I, have, can I invite uh, the four speakers as well as Ali to uh, the table? So we'll open the discussion to the audience. Ali, oh, would you join? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, was, I, I thought it was two minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it's you know uh, four 
presentations, very interesting. As Ali pointed out, they involve different aspects of uh, uh, practice. They deal with different scales of practice. And uh, before I open the questions to the floor, uh, as a moderator, I'll take the opportunity to ask uh, the first question. Uh, yesterday, I think, uh, during Peter's insightful talk, uh, we talked about the process of design thinking. In the design process, uh, iteration is unavoidable. To some extent, entrepreneurship is also about iteration. So during this iteration, I think there's commonality between the two that often when we have to make choice of what to do for next step, there is process of uh, critical reflection and even introspection. So during that uh, self, uh, you know, uh, reflection and introspection uh, to focus on the next step, I'm sure there are times that you do have to think about the individuality that's involved in the solution of your design, your strategy, or your product versus uh, market use, uh, marketplace use. So in that sense, that's the differentiation between design and entrepreneurship to some extent that entrepreneurship, you do have to think about marketability, you do think have to think about profitability. So when you face that kind of tension or uh, conflict, um, how do you make choices? And what's usually your thought process? Anyone? <laughs> I, I can take it. Um, or at least I can take a stab at it. Um, I, I think that the biggest, uh, the biggest um, mindset that you have to approach iteration is um, uh, the, the, the opportunity to learn from failure, right? Because we're so obsessed with getting things right the first time, especially as, as designers. And we would, we would iterate, iterate, iterate on the, on the design side um, until we build something and then we, uh, we launch it and then we find out that, well, we haven't really anticipated. Uh, all, all the possible uh, variables that might affect our design. Um, so I, I think until we have the mindset that it, it is okay to fail <laughs> and it's okay to, to recover and, and iterate and completely reset, uh, I, I think it will be uh, yeah, much, much harder to, to implement uh, design iteration in uh, yeah, everyday projects. Mm -hmm. I guess the, 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 the decisions um, are difficult, and at one moment you make them, it's relative to which point in the process you are. What point is less relevant than what is the culture that supports the recognition of that moment of decision, for that decision? Um, the hardest thing for us has been um, establishing the culture across multiple disciplines, working in tribes, teams, to reward failure in professions that are not used to fail or wanting to not fail. You tell a, a scientist, a hydrologist, an economist, is trying to look for that level of precision and really not trying to pursue failure directly. Uh, so having established that culture is what allows us to recognize at one moment um, it, of that iteration process you can go and retrieve to your corner to seek alternative solutions. But usually, in our case, that comes um, as a decision of the team when they have said, well, we have learned enough from all these failures. Now let's try these other components, or let's try these other ways to address this, this process, this problem. And, and that in, in, our, in our perspective, that, is, that was more about establishing an initial culture that very much, uh, as designers, we learn in the studio. Uh, when we actually, I don't know if re reward is the right word, looking at uh, Ivan's email, <laughs> but but definitely encouraged to see positivism on, on that matter. Okay. Yeah. Jenny? I, th I think that for every um, situation or for every issue, there is actually a truism and a, a sense of what is right and what is correct for that given situation, be it cost or the constituents or... or um, and so we like to believe that we just haven't quite got there yet and that we're missing something. So coming from a research background, 
That means we didn't cut the right section, we didn't consider the right materials, we don't know enough, we don't have all the, the tools on hand to come to that sort of truism. And I think we all as designers know when we've gotten there and that um, what's hard given our limited resources in, in the working environment is to take that next step and to invest in, in going forward and um, sort of searching out uh, and reframing and then being satisfied with uh, uh, or attaining the truth that should be there. Mm -hmm. And I think that that takes sometimes just an inner fortitude to just keep going. Okay, good. Nari? I think for me, uh, iteration, um, I think that that's what we deal with every day, actually. I think it's more important to, to first ask or frame the question of the analysis in the right way from my perspective in the environmental design world. Um, and yes, uh, we do fail a lot as well. Um, so we learn from that, you know, and then we starting to cut. Uh, most of the time, I think the best way for us to approach is uh, just to frame what's the best and then the worst case scenario. And once you know both and you, you typically would know what's going to go in between. So iteration does come into play uh, a lot in my, in my field. Okay, good. The focus on iteration um, seems like only Juan and uh, even mentioned that if there is that conflict in terms of your bottom line, what you're going to do. But we're going to uh, stop here. I want to open the question to uh, the floor. Yes, up there. Thank you, and very glad to see most of the people at the table shared time during this year. I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, a number of topics that align with my question. Um, Ali um, summarized the, the, the idea of the strategies, and um, most of you have expressed this idea of more complex, challenging, wicked problems. Um, and Ivan, at the end, suggested that most organizations are trying to become leaner and smaller and more efficient. So my question is, and perhaps a topic that is not discussed enough in design schools has to do with organizational change and organizational design. And this idea of what are the right structures that you need to put in place to make these new uh, business models or these new ways to uh, engage with complex stakeholders in projects. So can you talk about in your own practices or in your own experience, uh, are, you, are you able to design this type of new organizations or in your own teams? How do you make that organizational structure to be able to uh, provide your solutions or your, or your, or your uh, strategy role? Um, yes, I can take this again first. Uh, well, I, I've noticed that, um, as, as I mentioned, that d design is becoming a focus for various organizations. Uh, and. I mean, I've been mostly involved with uh, software organizations, uh, but uh, the mandate has really come um, from from the top down. So the, the executive leadership uh, realizes that design is needed uh, in an organization, and then they'll put in place uh, the, the infrastructure that would support um, the, the design leadership. Uh, and then the, the infrastructure would support uh, the, other, the other business units. Um, so I think um, ultimately business leaders are starting to realize that design, as, as I mentioned, is, is adding value in, in everything we do. And uh, they are driving this uh, just, just because it, it becomes part of the, of the fabric of whatever they're offering, uh, being software for architects like Autodesk or even, even uh, global banks. So that, that's encouraging. Thank you, Carlos, for the question. It's, it's a really tough question, actually, because uh, in all practicality, experimentation and failure is not that easy to implement when you have a budget and a timeline and such. Um, or in our case, our work has spread in about 22 countries. So every new commission is learning about a new culture setting and such. And that is quite challenging. And how do you structure a team around that is, is even more complex. In our case, we, we take the, the formation of the team as an experiment itself. It, meaning that the team can evolve to include uh, numerous people across numerous stages of the project, or even why to have a team in the same place. In most of our projects, we have teams dispersed uh, on our different offices uh, with local consultants or local you know, uh, ethnographers or whatever it is. Um, and then from that moment, as we go in failing, basically searching this field as a 
closer to this level of completeness or incompleteness that we may be trying to, to achieve, uh, we begin mutating the, the team by uh, self-recognition of, uh, of new domain knowledge or new uh, uh, interactive knowledge or new technologies. Uh, for instance, in our initial projects, we didn't use much data scientists uh, at the beginning of the project. Now, a data scientist uh, that does data mining, uh, internet web, you know, uh, data scrapping or whatever these things is, is on the first day of the project to begin formulating how data may need to be incorporated to begin measuring our success or failure. I can go next. Uh, I think for, for my company, it's more, I think the first thing is open mind set. Um, that's quite important. And then collaborate together and then bring out, I think celebrate uh, uh, each individual um, expertise is also one of the things that I that I do every day uh, with my team. So not, not everyone, you know, will be the expert in one thing, but I think it's more of a collaborative effort of different um, aspect. And I have to say that the more, the more, the longer that I'm doing this, it's starting from just with like uh, building owners, you know, or like uh, just individual like company to now up to the government, I think sector as well, specifically in Singapore, I work a lot with government um, projects. So that's also becomes uh, quite a challenging thing to also deal with stakeholder, like public, you know, to the public level. So it's kind of, I think, building up the game. And then for me personally, also, I'm uh, now also supporting on like a committee, you know, on sustainability uh, at, at the country level as well. So I think uh, for the team, but the back end team needs to be uh, kind of working together collaboratively and open mind. Yeah. I think that um, if you're trying to build an organization, the, the base that is very light and nimble on its feet. Um, is interested in experimenting for the sake of making things better, um, that you have to build that culture, and that if the culture doesn't exist, it's a hard, daunting task. And part of that culture means embracing new technology. I think we all do. It means um, reinvesting, uh, continually reinvesting, and then to, to support the idea that experimentation, research, and reiteration of what you're doing to achieve an end goal is the way your company functions. Because without that, uh, it's a hard go, really hard go. Thank you. Next question, yes. Oh, so sorry. Okay, he already has a mic, so I'll ask him to speak first. Um, yes, thank you guys. Um, first of all, I wanna just kind of uh, acknowledge two things. The first thing is to you, Janine. Um, I just love the extensive uh, plethora of BIM that you've used. Uh, I always tell people of the 13 years I've used it, I still spend 12 years defending it uh, um, because it's still <laughs> yet to catch on in certain I have sectors. You to blame. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, especially in the area of academia. But it's uh, and then Ivan, I feel your pain, brother. Uh, I've been there, um, you know. So I commend you for the resilience and uh, persistence. Um, really, I, I came here today because I wanted to, um, I myself, especially as an African-American, um, am very, very discouraged by um, not only what's been going on in the midst of the election and how all of a sudden, you know, uh, race, uh, race relations and gender relations are popular, you know, for people like me, you know, this is life. And so I was hoping to come here and just hear a little bit more about how some of you are dealing with uh, the issue of raising social awareness. And one, I definitely loved your presentation in regards to um, how you're using uh, technology and so forth to tackle the issues of trying to um, basically have designers make more informed design decisions. And I think the words you two are looking for are design activists. You know, not just from an environmental, environmental aspect, from a social aspect, because I feel like those are the two biggest things these days. One word I didn't hear all uh, any of you for really talk about is social media. Um, as you know, um, especially, uh, again, once again, in the midst of this election, we're starting to see the downturn of mainstream media and starting to see the uprise and tick of social media and the idea of learning how to communicate to people that you wouldn't necessarily communicate to, communicate to and getting rid of this notion that perception is reality because a lot of times they really aren't. So I wanted to get your take on, especially from the social aspect, how are you guys using social media 
to really inform designers how to make uh, responsible design decisions. Good question. I, I, I definitely think that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, this is one of the things that I, that I mentioned uh, as an opportunity, right? So how can we actually learn from all the data that is being generated and that is being captured and um, make better design decisions? So for example, even uh, social media uh, companies have, uh, have used to really understand um, patterns of, of movement, uh, you know, uh, thought, thought process for, for specific uh, groups of people. Uh, understand um, influence, right, and, and identify influencers within certain um, within certain topics. Uh, so I think this this is an opportunity for us to to understand better um, as as designers how how we can learn from from the new uh, from the new uh, channels of, of communication and the new data points that are being created. Um, I personally have, have no experience in um, sort of using social media to inform design decisions. But I think that's, that's a great opportunity. I would like to respond very quickly in how we use or how we're beginning to use social media. One is as, as data points on reactions relative to keywords and the geolocation of those reactions relative to the profile of people. And there's a lot of work that has been going on in research on this arena, so we don't claim anything new about it. We just learn to see how we mine that data and how we incorporate that into our analytical processes. Uh, the most important part for us is how can be a channel to create design research awareness. Um, and I need to give this credit completely to Flavio Charafia, which is an MLA graduate from a couple of years ago from GSD that has been leading our, our entrepreneurship platform uh, in Chile. Uh, when the idea is how a company that looks at this type of technologies and this type of approaches arrive to a, a place that uh, may not necessarily be entirely welcoming of these new approaches in which engineering, architecture, and search are so established that will be going against the wave. And what he came up with was like, creating very short clips about how design thinking that takes data, everyday experiences, and political connections is going to create demand for this type of services or this type of design research approaches across, across the country and the region. So uh, these are two different ways in which we're using it. And, and, and it's too early to say what level of effectiveness we're going to have. But uh, um, it, is, it is two of the ways that we're using it. I saw the sign stop in Margaret's hands. Do we need to stop or can, can we take a last question? One oh, yeah, one more question, the last question. Yes, please. Thank you. I was in the same situation as you, Ivan, five years ago. So when I, um, I, I defend my proposal, and with a few questions, with Tony Edward and the chair, and with, but after that, they have a long discussion. And then Tony, with the chair, told me that you, uh, you need to defeat your paper. But to be honest, we don't know how to advise you now. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about that. <laughs> Just think about that. What I think that, uh, but I think the, the, the key success for me that the Tony, the great advisor, and he helped me to overcome uh, come it. And it set, I think, very clear path for me. Seen then so far, I know how to go ahead. Can you guys share with me and the other folks here what is your most difficult moment here? And how it sets your future. <laughs> Thank you. I think I'm done here. So. <laughs> well, you know, um, as you know, of what have you heard, and Martin has said that I had a very unique experience here as a DDA student. And uh, the two comments that sort of have stuck with me all these years is one of the students came up to me and said, well, do you know what's better than a Harvard degree? And I said, uh, I'm not sure. And he says, a uh, Harvard degree from Hawaii. <laughs> so that was the first one. <laughs> and then the second one was, uh, we were sitting in a group of people meeting, uh, I think d -Des meeting, and someone says, it is so unfair. And I was like, what? 
and they go, whenever you're in the classroom, it's like you've automatically got your hand up. You just scratch your nose or you, know, you, you move your hair and everyone immediately wants to know what you're gonna say. <laughs> and he, they said, that's so unfair. And, um, you know, and then someone alluded to the fact that my, uh, my uh, perhaps uh, my actual doctoral degree wasn't the same as theirs because uh, it wasn't uh, sort of obtained the same way. And uh, I just, uh, you know, remind myself that uh, it was a Harvard experience, slightly different one, but a Harvard experience nonetheless. The hardest thing was getting myself to class every day. Um, not only physically, and Jeff can attest to this, all the uh, digital challenges, but also it was two o'clock in the morning for me, right? And uh, so uh, one of the central topics of my thesis was how do we, as life speeds up, and how do we, uh, how do we change hats? So I'm sure in this room, everyone wears three or four or maybe five hats. And before, you know, you get it, you get your kids ready to go, you get in the car, you drive to work. Now you're video conferencing. You might be doing it from home in your pajamas. Uh, you might be fe feeding your kid. Uh, and so how do we very quickly change hats, com compress and decompress, and um, appear normal to each other? And so I think that that continues to be one of the, the biggest challenges. And it was certainly the challenge. Um, at, at the GSD. The thing uh, for me, the challenge uh, was about, um, actually, uh, when I graduated, it was actually record time as well. It was only uh, two years, three months. That was um, basically how long I spent um, at the DDAS program. Um, so the reason I bring it up was because uh, I, I had to graduate, but it's not because I need to graduate. I had to grad graduate because I supposed to teach the class actually the next day after my graduation. So it was kind of like Dan Cho that was like, you need to finish your dissertation and tomorrow you're teaching in a way as well. Um, but one thing that I remember, Michelle was way up there, that Michelle told me, because I'm quite a very thorough person, so I'm doing everything in detail. So that's like, doing things fast is definitely not my way. Um, but one thing that Michelle taught me, and I'm still using it, and this ties with innovation too, is that I'm walking into a DDS program, which is like a room, right, with many doors. And I just need to select one door, open that door, and I will get into another room with many doors again, um, you know, with many opportunities. And I'm using it every day that I see one thing that I do leads to this innovation in design. And then I open the door and there's another thing. And I think it's gonna keep continuing that way. So thanks, Michelle, for that advice. <laughs> um, well, uh, my advisor uh, was Carl Steinitz, so I got emails like that every week. <laughs> uh, Carl is the most uh, caring person, but he's incredibly direct and, and blunt about that. And um, so that was not my challenge, most challenging moment. That was just the nature of every week for me. Um, it, I guess the most challenging thing, it refers back to something Martin mentioned at the beginning, to the, that is, or no, I'm sorry, um, um, there was a, it was mentioned about the experimental nature, actually it was Antoine that mentioned that, the experimental nature of the program, and the question is how are you supposed to deal with this experimentation as you get close to graduation? And, and what are you supposed to do with it? And, and I guess, uh, if I would have been in an event like that, seeing the entrepreneur nature, nature of what we can do with design research approaches, uh, uh, that would have been probably a little more comforting. But I guess as we get close to, as I got close to graduation, thinking what to do, you know, should I go teach? Should I go do a postdoc? Should I go to practice? Uh, and where is the best and most um, natural place to, to do what I do? Um, but I need to say that that being the most difficult, sort of the last year particularly being difficult as you're trying to wrap up a dissertation and getting emails like that and such, um, it was also the community what actually helps the most. And saying, don't worry about it, just, you know, you have to do what you really care for. And if that's, and if that's not exist, create it. And, and that's why I actually, Ivan said that we graduated the same year um, and, and I went to start the company actually in the middle of the recession. And believe me, there's something crazy is to start companies in the middle of the recession. So um, that's, that's a little of my story. Okay, if I can add and also wrap up this, um, just one moment. There are many moments during you know, the DDES that uh, to some extent uh, have impact on um, life and also you know, uh, the way of thinking. Uh, but one moment I w do want to address my advisor uh, with Peter Rowe. 
and my dissertation was focusing on the intersection between uh, architectural profession and uh, you know uh, politics in China. So therefore, when I was going to uh, mention to Peter that I got uh, you know offer from Lehman Brothers, so I'm going to work for Lehman Brothers. I was very nervous. I was waiting for the moment that Peter may say, "Hey, focus on your you know dissertation and." Uh, that's not really what you need to focus on. But instead, Peter didn't really take a minute. And he said, I think you should go forward. And I think that's going to be good for you. And until today, I remember that. And it turned out, yes, um, not only changed the trajectory of my life, and also it opened the door for me to see the complexity of the capital markets, how capital circulates and to some extent gets involved in the built environment. So for that, uh, thank you very much, Peter. And also with that note, and uh, I'd like to uh, wrap up this uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the speakers.